been distributed lethality, cost imposing measures. Um, when, when we were directed to do the studies in the same NDA 16 uh, that the FSA supported, uh, it directed us to move out on future force architectures and every study since then has validated the need to move on to these other capabilities. The effect of Truman will be felt in about 2027 to 2029 when she would have come out of the yard. So to the initial question on force generation, if we do nothing between now and then, yes, it'll, it'll affect the force generation model. Uh, the way we have structured this, uh, the investments we are going after, uh, we will continue to study it. We will continue to experiment with it. Uh, we elected to make this bold decision early. Uh, every, every year counts. We could have waited. We decided that we didn't want to lose that year to figure out which direction we want to go with these alternate investments. So this is about distributed lethality to complement the force, not to replace the force. Mm -hmm. uh, do these independent studies also support a 12-carrier force structure? These independent studies uh, supported a larger Navy. So if you remember, we had our FSA plus the other three. So there was some degree between uh, roughly 350 and 400 ships of varying uh, mixes. I don't recall if anyone went below 12. Mm -hmm. Uh, regardless, we went with our assessment of 12 carriers, and that's still the requirement, and our commitment to that is the Ford class. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, and uh, now we'll turn to uh, Ms. Luria, Vice Chair. <clears throat> well, thank you, and I'm going to continue along the same line of, of questioning about the aircraft carriers. So you, you did acknowledge that the current law requires us to um, have 11 operational aircraft carriers. What we didn't touch on is the air wing. So it requires us to maintain nine operational air wings through October 1st of 2025. Um, and then after that point, we should maintain 10. Is that correct, um, Mr. Gertz? Uh, I believe so. Bill, any comment on that? Uh, yes, ma'am. That's the, there's actually a couple uh, legislation directions out there. One is the nine now and then have 10 by 2025 or okay. by the um, 40s, 12. So you know, I just still am really baffled um, at how the Navy can uh, submit a budget that decommissions the Harry S. Truman halfway through their life cycle. And moreover, the 30-year shipbuilding plan from 2025 on has no more than 10 operational carriers, and sometimes it only has nine. And so I'm, I'm really confused as to your choices in funding in the budget, because I believe that any budget that the, ex the executive branch submits has to start with the things that are mandated by Congress to be fully funded. And it seems as though, you know, you're, you're coming before Congress and this could be some sort of shell game where, you know, you request to not fund the Truman, uh, but you're looking for unmanned surface vessels. I mean, I don't think that the Secretary of Defense, the President's going to turn to the Secretary of Defense and say, where are my unmanned surface vessels when a conflict breaks out in the world? They're going to turn and ask, where are my aircraft carriers? And so we're based this off of a, a force structure assessment um, that tells us, you know, we need the 11 carriers. And if we look back at um, what Captain Burke, then 43, said um, at a hearing like this several years ago, he said the cheapest ship we have out there is the ship we already have. Uh, we just have to take care of that ship, make sure it lasts for its full expected service life. And so that is step number one. Um, so I just can't even comprehend the thought process that we're quote unquote saving money by decommissioning a ship halfway through its life. If you look at the amortized cost of this ship over 25 years versus 50 years, we've really sunk a lot of taxpayer money into an asset that we're not going to fully utilize. So how do you explain that? Uh, yes, ma'am. So in, certainly in isolation, uh, divesting at 50% of the service life is, is a tough comprehensive investment strategy. But when you put it in the context of the threat vectors, the evolution of the Navy, the way we operate as a forward deployed Navy, the need to be more distributed. Well, I would stop there. Operate as a forward deployed Navy. So we go into the OFRP, and now instead of generating forces that are deployed and on station, we're generating surge capability. We've met with several combatant commanders recently. I asked CENTCOM if he got his required um, requested carrier presence. Um, although he didn't give me an exact number, I know it's about one-fifth of what he requests. I asked the commander of UCOM the same thing. He said he gets less than half of what he requests. So, you know, I, in an unclassified setting, we can't get any more into the numbers than that. But I can tell you that I personally know that we're not meeting that forward deployed presence. So how can you justify further reducing the number of carriers? 
Uh, yes, ma'am. So we're not meeting the presence in a lot of ship lines. Uh, you can have the same discussion with the destroyers, with the submarines, with the aircraft carriers. So what we are compelled to do is to find alternate investments to improve the lethality, the distributed nature and the way we operate, the survivability, the cost imposing effects, and then if it comes to it, more tritable force. So do you attribute that to our choice to go to the OFRP? Uh, the Optimized Fleet Response Plan, because before we were getting six out of roughly every 24 months deployed, we go to six out of 36 months deployed. That gets us 17% on station time versus roughly 25% on station time. If you do the math backwards and you figure out how many ships we need, instead of 355, we'd need 251 if we were on station 25% of the time. So, you know, the Navy came to Congress, they briefed this uh, OFRP plan, but there was really no price tag or operational impact associated with that. So are you looking at whether that's effectively generating the forces that we need? Uh, yes, ma'am. We look at that all the time. Uh, so the OFRP is the supply-based model based on the force structure we have. The requirements are driven by the O plans and actual combat operations that we're going to have to surge when we need them. So, uh, you know, there is a seeming disconnect between the peacetime rotation of the forces versus what we can surge in combat, which drives the actual requirement. So, you know, I, I sat down with the CNO recently to, to have this discussion, and I, I'm still very interested in, and I'll request again, um, the analysis as to how you have come up with the 355 ship Navy as the appropriate size. Is it the most limiting O plan? Um, is it based off combatant, command requ combatant commander requirements? So, um, you know, as part of this hearing, I would still like to follow up and understand how you came to that calculation. I yield my time. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. And um, next up is Mr. Uh, Bergman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, <clears throat> thank you all for, for being here today. It, um, numbers matter, but lethality matters more. And uh, as we, uh, I know I'm telling you what you already know because we're counting on you to be honest brokers when it comes to being uh, forward deployed as a Navy and Marine Corps, but lethal in such a way that in a best case scenario, any adversary would choose not to fight us because they know it would be a bad outcome for them. So having, you know, having said that, um, you know, uh, the, um, we've got a, several questions here, but, but, but let's start with something, you know, near and dear to my heart. Uh, we used to call it Gator Navy and Brownwater Navy and whatever we call it now, the bottom line is we were, we were as be, Marines being hauled or not hauled, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, uh, you know you're getting old when your ship you were deployed on to Vietnam is, was, uh, is now a diving reef off Hawaii. But anyway, having said that, General Berger, uh, the President's budget does not include a request for any large deck amphibs. Uh, do you think that our legacy forces can operate in a contested environment? Um, are there improvements that need to be made? Uh, does the Navy have sufficient capacity to support our, our Marine Corps operations? Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, the two parts of that, as you outlined, are the capacity, the number, and the capability of the ships themselves. Over the uh, fight up in this uh, budget, there's three amphibs that will be procured. The capacity, the requirement for the Navy for the nation remains 38, based on the 2016 force structure assessment. Now, there's an, an ongoing force structure assessment now that I think will be done by the end of the year, which we'll see how that plays out. But right now, it's 38. And the second part of the 38 is not just the aggregate number, but the breakdown of the types of ships centered on the big def gambibs. The bottom line on more modern ships are, for us, they give us the capability that the legacy older ships you can't retrofit back into them, and it begins with command and control systems and the ability to defend the ship and an offensive arm as well. So all of them, to a degree, you can put in the WASP, you can put in the Essex, but you really, you really need the new ships in all type model series that give us another level of capability. Okay, so you need the survivability of the of what the new capability the ships bring. Yes, sir, we do. Um, I understand that the that the Marine Corps has also done extensive studies and analysis on the expeditionary advanced base operations. Uh, this concept relies heavily on the ability to seize, you know, establish, and operate on widely dispersed bases. Since a critical function for the logistics network will be to sustain these bases, do you feel that the CH-53 Kilo 
gives you much more capacity and capability over the legacy uh, CH-53 Echo uh, or any other logistical system to support the EABO concept? Sir, I do. I think to, um, and we're learning about expeditionary advanced base operations as we go. This is a large part of our exercises and experimentation. We're going to need every bit of vertical lift and surface connector that we have. Absolutely, uh, the, the kilo gives us range and payload that the Echo does not. And it's going to give us a level of reliability that you would expect in a new aircraft as well. So as you, as you talk about that, I mean, obviously you've commanded one MEF, you've commanded uh, MAR-4 PAC. Um, uh, any additional insight in, on how, how the force struggles with the, the CH-53 Echo readiness? the availability now, because you now only have a force of, what, 142, uh, 53 echoes uh, against a requirement for uh, 200 or to 220, uh, uh, 53 kilos. Uh, any uh, any thoughts on, on where the, the mismatch is and here where the gap is? I think last probably spring or uh, early summertime, uh, our aviation department looked into what what got us to where we are and made some significant changes in the 53E reset program. And like all reset programs, it's not an overnight venture, but over a six month period, we're seeing a climb back up in the 53 echo readiness from that reset program. And a part of that was uh, a really brilliant move to move together, not just the, the work that you would normally do in a depot, but after the depot, you would return it back to the squadron, and then they would have to do more work on the work that the depot wasn't, wasn't depot-level work. So we merged them together as part of the reset program. It's really benefited us. Okay. Well, thank you, and uh, I see my time has expired. Thank you very much to all of you for your continued service. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bergman. Uh, next up is Mr. Golden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you for being here, gentlemen. Uh, no, I'm, I'm pleased to see that the Navy is pursuing its, its plan for a fleet of 355 ships, but I do want to note with concern that the administration might not be investing sufficient reforces, uh, resources in our shipyards to support an expansion, which will require sustained attention and support not only to the fleet, but to fleet maintenance over a period of many years. Uh, I specifically want to note that the Navy's 2020 shipbuilding plan calls for aggressive growth and service life extensions of current vessels. At the same time, in December, uh, GAO report noted that the Navy has been unable to complete ship and submarine maintenance on time, resulting in continuing scheduling delays uh, that reduce time for training and operations, something we've talked about quite a bit already uh, in this Congress, and also uh, creating costly inefficiencies in a resource-constrained environment. The report elaborated that facility and equipment limitations at shipyards resulted in significant maintenance delays and that shipyards would be unable to support an estimated one-third of maintenance periods planned over the next 23 years. I think this is particularly important given your plan to getting to a, a Navy of 355 ships. So I wanted to, for whichever of you uh, you feel is most appropriate to take the question, uh, please describe what steps you feel are necessary to ensure that our shipyards are adequately resourced to provide the support and maintenance uh, that we need for a larger fleet, but also to support an increase in vessels undergoing service life extensions. Yeah, thank you, sir. I'll, I'll start out with that. Uh, and as you uh, uh, appropriately note, you know, constructing ships is important. Uh, maintaining them is critical uh, and really leads to our warfighting capability of today. And so uh, we are tackling that, uh, I would say, in two or three different uh, lines of activity and happy to sit down with you to go through those in some more detail uh, as time allows. For the public yards, we've accelerated hiring of the public uh, shipyard workforce. We've done that a year early, so we are now at our full strength there. Uh, we are now attacking the infrastructure. I think the average age of our 1,300 buildings in the shipyard is 62 years old. Particularly problematic are the dry docks. So in the public yards, we're doing uh, three things, replacing and uh, re um, Vitalizing the dry docks, which are aging and failing. Uh, we are now looking at um, restructuring the yard for efficiency. We think we can get 65% uh, improvement in uh, cycle time just by resequencing where the work's occurring on those yards in terms of, uh, of that. And then the third piece is recapitalizing the equipment. That's on the public yard. On the private yard, a whole host of initiatives, uh, mostly for the surface side, uh, so that we can achieve that. And finally, we've 
documented that in the first years, uh, first time we wrote our 30 year maintenance plan. Uh, and so it's a generation one product. We'll continue to improve that to ensure we're putting a focus on it. Thank you. Well, clearly this is really important both for submarines and uh, large surface combatant uh, ships like the DDG-51 uh, early bird class destroyer, which I know is a big part of your plan on how you're going to get to 355 sooner. Um, you know, I just want to uh, make note for the record, and, um, you know, sat, th sat through our earlier full committee hearing and not having had the opportunity to ask questions, this is not directed to any of the three of you, that uh, I want to reiterate my concerns shared by many of my colleagues here in the House and in the Senate. Uh, that funds that we have appropriated for our shipyards for that ma maintenance upgrades and, and ensure that they're able to do that work, uh, expand this fleet, and do those service life extensions is potentially at risk and being rated for purposes that have nothing to do with our uh, naval capabilities uh, and ability to deal with, with growing threats from China and Russia. Um, and just noting my opposition and, and real concern about that and to the health of our national security as a result. Um, I also wanted to ask. Uh, seeing in your testimony that you noted that the Flight 3 DDG-51 vessels are going to feature enhanced integrated air and, and missile defense, which is going to help the Navy meet the growing ballistic missile threat uh, by improving radar sensitivity and enabling longer-range detection of increasingly complex threats. Uh, to the extent that you can, um, whoever wants to take this question, could you elaborate on how these systems on the upcoming DDG-51s aid the surface fleet in addressing the threats posed by improved ballistic missile capabilities with China and Russia? Uh, yes, sir. Um, if I may, I'll, I'll kind of address your previous question just for a second here. You mentioned aggressive growth. Uh, so the SSN, the third DDG, both those are aggressive growth options. But the most important uh, imperative in any of this, and it uh, gives me the opportunity to thank the committee, is get that budget uh, approved on time. And we saw the magic of a detailed shipbuilding plan, long horizon, steady funding, uh, and the ability to plan, not just plan shipbuilding, but plan maintenance, the enablers, the recruiting, everything that goes behind it. <clears throat> um, as far as the DDG-51, I, I, uh, I think you're referring to the Flight 3 uh, DDG. Uh, from where we sit, it's the most powerful warship uh, in the, on the planet. It's going to have the best of everything we have. We're even expanding the facilities to make it an air warfare command ship. Uh, it'll be dual role. Uh, I can't get into all the details, but it will be able to do air defense and ballistic missile defense at the same time. So a very powerful addition to the ship. Uh, uh, they start entering the fleet at 23 and FY23, and then we're DDG Flight 3 is all the way through. We're very, very much looking forward to getting that ship in the fleet. Uh, this time last year, I believe, you testified before the subcommittee that the Navy would be taking a fresh look at the December 2016 force structure assessment due to changes that were coming out of the National Defense Strategy. And you said at the time that, quote, we have to move out aggressively as we go forward. Then in September, you again announced that the Navy would be conducting a new FSA along with an interim assessment that I believe is due sometime in 2019. Given the urgency that you rightly noted uh, last March before this committee, can you walk me through what progress has happened on the new FSA between March and September last year? Uh, yes, sir. So this, this FSA that is coming up, um, it turns out, has a lot more moving parts than the previous FSA. Uh, most notably, our shift in our employment of the force under this distributed maritime operations, which um, really kind of gets to one of your interest items on uh, the distributed logistics that have to support that, um, that type of force, which pulls in uh, a lot of capabilities into the smaller shipyards on what we're going to be able to do going forward. So all this has to feed back into the FSA. Um, we had some uh, four-star and three-star turnovers that influenced the O plans and the planning scenarios. All those have to be accounted for into the FSA. Uh, I think it's always uh, important to remind everybody that the FSA tends to serve as two, three, or four budget cycles, and that's typically reflective of you know, just the ability of the shipbuilding industry to even respond to an FSA. It typically does not tell us things like we don't need submarines anymore or we don't need DDGs or frigates. It's, it's more of a quantity-based look at what we already have and how you would fight the, the, uh, the, uh, the conflicts today. Uh, we're expecting a pretty hard look at the mix of ships this year. Um, we, are, we know we are heavy on large service combatants. We'd like to adjust that to a more appropriate mix, especially with the lethality we're seeing coming along with the new frigate, uh, all shipyards have agreed that they can give us the lethality we need. 
Uh, I mentioned the distributed logistics. Uh, we also discussed, if you recall last year, the uh, medical support to our fleet, which is very limited by two hospital support ships when you start talking about a distributed maritime operation. All these requirements are still percolating along, uh, so we expect some, some growth in a lot of these areas, and that'll all be reflected on how this FSA actually uh, views the force. So do you anticipate that when the FSA is finally delivered that the fleet size requirement will remain constant at 355? Uh, I don't know if it'll remain constant. I would find it highly unlikely to come up with a lower number uh, yeah. based on the growing threat challenge. And given the, the anticipated shift or sort of emphasizing things below the level of large surface combatants, would you anticipate any change to the requirement at, for small surface combatants um, at 52? Uh, I would expect that number to change. Yes, Interesting. Sir. Upward or downward? I would assume upward, given what you said. I suspect it would go up. Um, and General Berger, uh, I don't want the Marine Corps to give up, get off easy today. Um, so I, I, I understand that the Marine Corps is developing currently a, a long-range direct fires capability that could provide the Marine Corps with a mobile anti-ship capability. What would that mean for the ability of the Navy Marine Corps team to counter maritime threats and implement the NDS, especially as it relates to the expeditionary advance base concept? Under the distributed maritime operations cons construct on top and the marine operating construct on top, underneath that, uh, is expeditionary advanced space operations the way you describe it, which is a very distributed way of using the naval expeditionary forces. Heretofore, the amphibious ships were largely protected by uh, surrounding ships around them. In a distributed manner, you want as much lethality and survivability on every craft that you can get. So, to your point, the ability to put uh, longer range uh, if not organic, then perhaps containerized weapon systems on an amphib ship in an offensive manner just complements the rest of the picture. Because in a sea control and sea denial sort of scheme, you would like for the forces that are at expeditionary advance bases not just to refuel, rearm, but also to reach out and pose a threat. Mm -hmm. Quickly, what per, uh, how much are you spending on F-35B slash C and CH-53K versus amphibious ships? I don't have that number off the top of my head, sir, but if I could take that for the record, I'll make sure I get the answer. Okay. I think the quick math looks like $94 billion on those two short-range expensive platforms versus $76 billion on ships. Um, but, yeah, please take that for the record and would love to follow back up with you. I'm out of time. Sure. Great. Thank you, Mr. Gallagher. Mr. Langevin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, I want to thank you for your testimony and thank you for your service to the country. Um, so I um, just want to uh, express my appreciation to the department and uh, uh, recognize the critical need for the uh, third Virginia class submarine in the uh, FY20 uh, budget request. And with regards to, to Columbia class, if I could just touch on this, can you provide us with an update right now on the, the common missile compartment project that we're working on with the United Kingdom? Uh, and uh, and uh, how uh, is this strategic uh, partnership being leveraged and uh, I'd like to know what best practices we are, are learning as we work with uh, one of our closest allies. Yes, sir. Um, uh, obviously, uh, our work with the UK across the board, but in particular uh, in this mission area, is uh, is critical and 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 one of our most trusted and, and longest relationships. And so we continue on Columbia and with their associated project to have a very uh, very close relationship. We're using common hardware. Where we are, you know, developing the missile tubes, producing missile tubes, shipping them over uh, in a compartment uh, to help them de-risk their initial builds while they build up some uh, similar capability. We have an absolutely close technical relationship, uh, and as we've worked through some of the issues we've seen on early missile tube uh, builds on the welds, uh, kept them uh, closely informed so they can uh, look for the similar thing uh, on any of their uh, their activities. I would also say best practice has been, you know, this really frank dialogue and then going after high risk parts of a program like the Columbia very early. And yes, we found some issues in those missile tubes, uh, even finding those issues and doing the rework, we still have uh, at least seven months of margin to schedule. And so that I would say best practice of finding the most risky elements of a program 
staging those well before you get into actual construction is paying uh, great dividends. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, and, and another, another topic, uh, I'm concerned about the uh, resilience of uh, Navy and Marine Corps bases, uh, in particular, uh, the effects of, of, of climate change and rising sea levels. Uh, we, we know that, uh, in, in not getting into the, the, the reasons why climate change is happening, but let's just look at the fact that it is happening, and it's, it's self-evident. Uh, last year, Camp Lejeune was heavily damaged by a major storm, uh, and uh, I'm concerned that the Navy and Marine Corps are not considering resiliency in their installation uh, master plans. So I want to ask, uh, you know, what are the investments that you're making today uh, in order to mitigate risks that uh, we still face in the short, medium, and the, uh, the long term uh, to our CONUS and OCONUS uh, insta uh, installations? And how are you evaluating those risks as they evolve? Sir, maybe I'll, uh, I'll give a kind of brief um, sense of it and then turn over the two gentlemen here for the service specific. But I, I think your uh, strategic view of how do we build resiliency uh, to climate, to um, cyber, to counter UAS, to all the sorts of things uh, is absolutely critical because uh, protecting the garrison uh, is part of protecting the force. It's, it's not a luxury. We can just assume the garrison will be uh, you know, immune to all the different types of threats to it, uh, you know, weather and climate being one of them. So I would say that's something at the department we're looking across the board, not just at the climate, but uh, I'll turn it over to Admiral Mers and General Berger for any thoughts they may have. Uh, yes, sir. So I, I certainly agree with Admiral Davidson's testimony from Indo-PACOM of climate change and the effect it's having, uh, not just on land, but also at sea. And we are certainly seeing the effects of that at home. Uh, unfortunately, I tell you that most of our investment is probably in repair and recovery from the damage, uh, but that has been the wake-up call as we uh, recalculate our MILCON investments as we go forward. And sir, I think uh, it won't be any surprises for the Marine Corps either. The, the damage to the buildings at Camp Lejeune that you note, sir, were largely from the buildings that were 40 to 50 years old. The newer buildings that in the 2000s and 2010s, uh, all, all fared very well. So uh, part of it certainly is the location, part of it is the design of the buildings themselves. Uh, but I don't, I don't think there's any misperceptions uh, between the Navy and Marine Corps about the need to address, whether it's MILCON or the location of a base, the effects of, of climate change and other factors. You, if you don't, then the risk, as you point out, sir, is pretty high. We're just going to be pouring good money after bad if we're repairing bases or building new uh, bases and not factoring in the, the, uh, the, the you know, changing weather patterns and seriousness of climate change. So uh, th that has to be a, a forethought and primary concern going forward. Again, we're going to be uh, throwing good money after bad. So uh, my time's expired. Uh, I have an additional question I'll ask for the record, but uh, thank you for your testimony. I yield back. Great. Thank you, Mr. Langevin. Uh, Mr. Byrne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, I was fascinated by the uh, expenditure you proposed on the medium and large unmanned vessels. Try to do my homework on this. This is a new thing for me. I do think it's a good idea for the Navy to do this. Um, and I know before you go through the R&D, it's hard to, to know a lot about the details of it, but can you give me some sort of an understanding of what the Navy's plan would be to transition from the R&D phase to actual production? Uh, yes, sir, and, and uh, as you know, it, it's um, doing R&D and figuring out exactly uh, the capabilities we need is, is critical. I would say what's a little bit different in these ships versus a traditional ship is uh, largely I think we can leverage more traditional conventional design versus having to redesign a whole new ship. And so the real R&D is in uh, a lot of the guts, the autonomy, the decision making, how are we going to come in and control it, how are we going to do those things, and less about what does the whole form look like, and, and quite frankly, I think we can, we can build the ships at a reduced price because it opens up a lot, a lot more shipyards uh, to a lot more of uh, designs they're comfortable with right now. And so we've got, as you know, a lot of activity going on. Our medium unmanned vessel did a transit to Pearl Harbor and back uh, autonomously learned a lot from that. We've got a lot of activity going on with the Special Capabilities Office. We've done phase one testing on the large uh, unmanned surface vessel. The real, I think, um, 
science we've got to work out is the level of autonomy, the level of command and control, uh, the level of protection we're going to need depending on the capabilities we put on those ships. As we work our way through that, I would anticipate going in the future. Right now we've got all of those loaded in R&D across the, the FIDEP. My guess is we will you know, probably in a future budget year transition some of that to procurement uh, as we understand exactly when that cutover point is and where it makes the most sense. I think we're still a couple of years away from that. Well, I, and I can understand that. I just wanted to try to get a little bit better understanding. I want to encourage you in this. I think this is the future in many respects for our Navy. I know there's some unknowns when you go into something like this, but I think spending this money through our R&D budget is a smart thing. Admiral Morris, I want to talk to you about, I think I, think I understood what you were saying earlier. Um, it looks like um, uh, EPF-14 is going to be a medical transport ship. So do you see the Navy going more in that direction with future uh, production? Uh, yes, sir. So when we did the, uh, we called it the Common Adaptable Small Ship Study, and we looked at all the logistics. As a matter of fact, uh, somewhere north of 11 different mission sets we evaluated that would have to come online to support the distributed maritime operations concept. Medical was a big piece of that. Uh, we have funded uh, TEPF-13. Uh, that will be the first uh, emergency medical transport. And then 14 is in the unfunded uh, priority list, uh, ranking very high, you'll notice, uh, because we consider that a war fighting capability, uh, not just a medical support uh, capability. So the, uh, uh, the preponderance of all those requirements, um, we're feeding back into the FSA. We know we need to get out. Uh, like I said earlier, the FSA doesn't really tell you what, what capabilities you need. It kind of gives the efficacy of the ones you have uh, and project it forward. Uh, we do the actual capability studies through, um, you know, a very detailed process of analysis of alternatives, these requirements evaluation teams, and, and we come up with the capability. We know we need this. Uh, how much of it we need long term, the FSA will inform us on that, but we have to get, get started. Very similar to the unmanned uh, vessels that you, uh, you cited earlier. I think while you were out, we had the discussion about every study we have done uh, has told us we need to have these capabilities. So we are shifting our investments and we're moving out on them. Thank you. And finally, General Barger, um, some of the other members of the committee have heard me say this before. I'm not sure you were here when I said it. I led the uh, Has Codel out to RIMPAC last uh, summer. It was a great trip. We were supposed to go on one of our amphibs, but one of our amphibs had a problem, so we went on an Australian amphib. It was great. Loved being with Aussies. They were great hosts. But I was kind of disappointed we didn't go on one of ours. So I just want to register my concern, echo General Bergman. Uh, I want to make sure we have enough amphibs to uh, it, to, to meet the mission requirements that we've placed upon you. And if there's anything we need to do to help you get to that point, please let me know. I'd like to be supportive of that. So I remember seeing you out there. It was, uh, that's a pretty amazing show. Yeah. And uh, demonstration of kind of all the capabilities in the Pacific. I think to your point, sir, the, the capacity part of 38 we discussed earlier. But I, I, one lens that that we use perhaps useful to look through. In terms of how useful are amphibs in the world we live in now and the world we're going into, I think you can boil it down into three areas. One is the steady state operations mm -hmm. around the world, that's deterrence and ability to react. Second, uh, a global cost imposition strategy if we're forced to fight. And third, the ability to project the force from the sea and sustain that force from the sea if you're told to do so. Nothing else does that in, that I have seen so far other than an amphibious force. Thank you, gentlemen. I yield back. Great. Thank you, Mr. Byrne. Uh, next up is Mr. Cisneros. Thank you, gentlemen, for, be, for being here this afternoon. Um, Secretary Gertz, the uh, Navy, I believe, currently has 289 ships, and we have a goal of getting to 355. Um, through testimony, we've had in earlier weeks about manning issues on Navy ships. Uh, the Navy has a shortfall of 6,500 people. Um, if we're going to get to th 355 ships, what are we doing to get more sailors? Ships need sailors. How are we, we going to be able to, to man these ships? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll maybe start with that and uh, ask Admiral Merge to, to, to probably. One of the things you've noticed in the shipbuilding plan over the last two cycles is broadening out from more than just the construction of ships and starting to look at both the cost to maintain them and the people to, to man them and be efficient in there. And that's something we're gonna have to 
continually go after. You're seeing some uh, manning changes in this year's budget. We still have work to go. Uh, part of the other thing uh, Admiral Merz and I worked on very closely in this year's shipbuilding plan is smoothing the ramp. Uh, be before it was a little bit jumpy, and that, that makes a hard manpower issue almost uh, impossible to work because you can't work the transition uh, between platforms. And so we're doing all we can to, to be as efficient as we can to, to take Manning into account as we transition to this 355 Navy. We still have work to go on overall Manning. And uh, Bill, if you want to add anything? Uh, yes, sir, just real quickly. We are probably as equally proud of smoothing that ramp than the acceleration by 20 years uh, because it makes everything more executable. Uh, manpower, funny thing, you touch the spigot, you have to wait around a couple years to see if you got the desired effect. Uh, this allows you to touch the spigot less frequently uh, when you have a, it literally is a continuous ramp to 355. Uh, last year's shipbuilding plan highlighted a lot of historical examples of the damage of a boom-bust cycle of the shipbuilding plan. We revisited that history a little more in this shipbuilding plan, but we've already seen the effect of continuous funding over the cycle uh, starting to naturally smooth out the, the ramps and then with the service life extensions, we're able to create the macro ramp up to 355 uh, uh, gradually and, and persistently. So the enabling accounts are gonna be in a much better predictive posture uh, to support the 355. And, and how exactly are we gonna ramp that up? I mean, is, is it just more recruiters, bigger bonuses? Sir, I, I would tell you, Admiral Burke would tell you that we've already ramped up. Mm -hmm. and now it's just staying on that ramp uh, between now and uh, uh, the predictive approach 355 at, at, uh, in 2034. Okay. Uh, second question. Uh, in testimony earlier today during a full hearing, Secretary Shanahan mentioned uh, the decision to re retire the Truman early could be revisited. Um, it was my understanding that this retiring the Truman uh, wasn't something that the Navy wanted to do, and I know from earlier testimony as well from uh, some of the commanders, that that is not something they want. Uh, they want carriers out there. They want to be able to, to have that show of force. Um, what would it take to, to re revisit that and to basically change that decision so that we keep the USS Truman? Yes, sir. Uh, the Navy fully supports the President's budget and the plan we brought over here. And again, as we talked about, some pretty hard decisions in terms of trading off uh, existing capability versus pivoting to some new capability. Having said that, um, the real um, effort to, to buy the long lead parts and all the things we need for the refueling wouldn't start until next year. And so that uh, we have this year to continue those analysis, continue the debate, uh, and understand um, whether that technology is going to uh, have merit in terms of that transition. Uh, versus the capability we currently have with the Truman. I yield back my time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cisneros. Uh, and now uh, up is Mr. Moult. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being here today. Um, Admiral, I'd like to ask you about the, the Navy FSA, uh, keeping in mind that the Navy will complete another FSA sometime this year. I'll use the 355 number that has been around for the last year or so. Why have we not included USVs and UUVs in our force structure analysis? In other words, why are we just looking at the traditional ships of the United States Navy rather than unmanned systems, which are clearly going to be such an important part of future warfare? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, we discussed earlier about the added complexity to this next FSA, uh, and that's one of them. Uh, we are going to account for these capabilities. The threat vectors have already told us we need to do these things. The FSA will give us more clarity on how many of them ultimately we're going to need. Uh, and it's not just the FSA. We have done, uh, starting with the three directed studies by Congress in the uh, uh, Authorization Act of 16, and every study since then has identified these capabilities as being force enablers that complement the battle force. We've already rolled them into war games. Uh, we have done some limited real world operations with them, including the uh, fight to Hawaii of our unmanned surface vessel. Uh, so they're very much a part of the calculus now in this, uh, this upcoming FSA, and you're gonna see a requirement coming out for them. So what is the, I mean, obviously this is a, this is a new weapon system that we are, is just coming online. What do you anticipate to be the trade-off between um, unmanned uh, uh, ships, whether they be surface or underwater, um, and the traditional ships that you have in the 
in the Navy? So the the one of the persistent questions are when are these things going to start replacing battle force ships? And so this is where we have to be very pragmatic on our approach. Um, yes, we are moving out very aggressively on developing the capability. And yes, we are probably pumping the brakes a little bit on when these things are actually going to replace ships until we get them out there, test them, and see what they can do. Can they get through a, a, a typhoon? Can Is the policy going to allow us to use them, uh, separating humans from weapons? A lot of things have to come in line uh, before we start counting them as battle force ships. So right now we're looking at them as enablers as we feel them and use them and get uh, a better insight on the true capability they bring. Uh, very evidence-based, like yeah, kind I mean, of a very, is it, that'll be a well, totally reasonable answer, and I mean, I don't disagree with it in principle, but I mean, how soon are the Chinese integrating these types of uh, ships into their Navy? I can't really comment on that. Uh, that's, a, that's an intel assessment. I know they're working on it as well, uh, but whether we integrate them or uh, use them as adjunct enablers, the capability is still coming online. I mean, just, you know, a RAND report on Chinese drones released in 2017 found that Beijing is funding at least 15 different university research programs into unmanned undersea and surface vehicles uh, with a particular emphasis on UUV projects. Uh, Russia's begun sea trials of the long-range UUV capable of carrying a, a nuclear warhead. In October 2016, the UK and France announced that they had awarded a $164 million contract to a group of uh, European defense firms to develop a UUV for mine countermeasures. You know, this year's request for small and medium UUVs is $40 million. Explain how we're gonna compete with such an incredibly small investment. Well, uh, this year's investment is actually 400 and about $450 million. We have 3.7 billion in the fit up. So this is kind okay, of- Okay, so maybe I have the wrong number. It's 450 this million. This is the essence of, of you know how, why we are shifting to these investments and the diversity of these investments. A huge shift for us in this particular budget. So if, if this is a huge shift, then why are we still fixated on this 1980s vision of a 355-ship Navy? I mean, why, why does that number even have any relevance today uh, if, if some of these things are going to be coming on in the next few years, long past the lifetime of the ships that we're building to meet this 355 number? Uh, yes, sir. So uh, we think it's completely relevant, and I, I probably have to get with you and walk you through the analysis of how we construct the FSA and how these capabilities will um, both enable and, and... But, I mean, you would agree that, that using a sort of 1980s type of measure for the for the strength of the Navy is not really relevant if you have different capabilities today. I mean, it's not like we're talking about, you know, how many, um, you know, square-rigged frigates that we need in the Navy. I, I would agree if that's what we did, but we use a, um, a much more current assessment model and wargaming and experimentation model uh, to determine the composition of the battle force. Okay. Sir, if I sure. could, yes, please. If I could just add, you know, it, I would say it's similar to aviation. I don't use it in either or. It's going to be an either and. Uh, and when we have this working right, both, both capabilities will complement each other. No, look, I totally, I, I, I love either and. And you won't meet, meet a service chief who doesn't love either and. But sometimes in budgeting, you have to do either or. And that's, and that's you know, th these trade-offs are, are, are what we have to get to the heart of with this, uh, with this yeah. discussion. Yes, sir. Uh, thank think, you. I think you saw the Navy make that hard trade-off by, um, by decommissioning the Truman early. And that was a hard trade-off we made in this budget cycle. Well, I would not be quick to disagree. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moulton. Um, so... Um, now that we have no votes out of us, uh, you can't leave, sorry. And, uh, and we're, we're gonna, I think, do a second round and, and again, welcome all the uh, subcommittee members to, to join in. I, I just had a couple quick follow-ons just uh, you know, from the first um, run through, which just wanted to uh, uh, go through quickly, which is, uh, again, we haven't really talked much about the Fast Frigate uh, program. I just wanted you to confirm for the record that uh, that program um, and planned contract award is proceeding on schedule, is that? Uh, yes, sir. We, we released our draft RFP a few months early, and we are uh, on it or ahead of our schedule for the full RFP and the competition. And, and <clears throat> excuse me, so the RFP is sometime in this calendar year, 2019? Yes, sir. We, uh, we originally planned to draft RFP in June. We released that in March, so we're taking all the inputs from the uh, potential competitors, and we intend to put the RFP and start the competition out this summer well ahead of our plan by the end of the fiscal year, 
that will position us well to make that award next year uh, and award the first frigate as proposed in the 20 budget. Great, thank you. And um, so the um, unfunded uh, priorities list came over um, and uh, one uh, item that sort of jumped off the page to our subcommittee was the um, funding for the uh, Boise and Hartford avails uh, are on the unfunded list. Again, uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, them being kind of in the queue for an awful long time. Could you just sort of explain why that's showing up on, on that list? Yes, sir. And, um, um, you know, obviously submarine maintenance, we've talked about the criticality of submarines. Submarine maintenance is something we are we're really working on hard. Um, we do not have all the capacity in the public yards or the private yards uh, to get after that. So it's not, again, not an either or. We need both of those uh, working well against us. We've, uh, we've seen improvement on the public yard in terms of reducing idle time uh, and buying back maintenance days. Um, right now we have two, uh, actually now three subs that are in idle time awaiting to get in Boise, one of them. The challenge with Boise has been uh, delays we've seen with the other submarines in the private yard maintenance. Uh, and quite frankly, we just can't get Boise in until we get the current submarines uh, in, the, in the docks at Newport News out. That slipped Boise into 20. Uh, we had planned to do it this year. That slipped it into 20. That occurred after the 20 budget was put together. That's why it showed up on the unfunded list. Uh, we have a burn down plan in terms of months of idle time that we are driving uh, to reduce that backlog by 23 so we have no ships with any idle time. That's our goal. We've got a burn down plan to get there. Uh, we're better than we were, but we are not where we need to be yet uh, in terms of uh, having ships with idle time, i.e. not certified waiting to get into maintenance. Uh, we've got a lot of improvement on maintenance delays on the back end, uh, but still have some work to go there, particularly with our private yard partners. And, and the Hartford? Uh, the the USS Hartford also was on that list. Yes, sir, and that was, uh, again, that's that's more of a shortfall of, uh, we talked about having that one, again, go to the private yards. Our original plan was not to have that uh, in the private yards, and so similarly, uh, unfortunately, when it goes to the private yard, well, we if we don't have it funded properly, uh, when we do the budget year as a private yard avail, then, then that causes us to have an unfunded uh, requirement that we've got to deal with. Okay, um, thank you, and lastly, um, you know, regarding the funding for uh, the third sub, which we discussed earlier, I mean, if the if the, the those funds are deferred uh, as a part of any final um, budget result, um, you know, does that sort of put that at risk in terms of again trying to find that sweet spot in 2023 that you described earlier? Yes, sir. I mean, this is a somewhat of a unique uh, time because we can we can fold it in as we get later in the 20s, and you start to run up against Columbia. Uh, and and uh, causing problems as we as we grow to Columbia, and if I can go maybe circle back to the other issue, we have seen some overruns on the private yard maintenance. Some of the dollar adjustments you see in Boise was we had to slip the availability. Some of the lesser dollars were more that we've had overruns in the current availability, which are slipping into twenty. Right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Whitman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Lieutenant General Berger, I wanted to uh, touch base with you on some issues involving our amphibious fleet, and thanks for the great work you're doing there at uh, Marine Corps Combat Development and Integration. I know lots of challenges looking what the future force will be and what the needs are there. I want to look at where we are today. We are at 33 ships going into 2020 as far as the components of amphibious ships within the fleet. The requirements at 38. You take a little bit deeper look under the hood, you heard uh, Representative Burns' comments about one of our amphibious ships not being available there at RIMPAC, so the issues of maintenance and the readiness state of our amphibious ships also uh, becomes an issue. If you look at the 30-year shipbuilding plan, uh, you see uh, no large deck amphibs there as far as time-wise time in order to meet that component of the requirement and, and where we would need to be. Um, and this year's budget request, we see uh, no amphibious ship request, no amphibious connectors. So there's some concern about, you know, where are we going to be with the necessary capability within the Navy for Marine Corps operations? I wanted to get your idea and your best professional military judgment. Uh, do you believe the current track uh, will impact the Marine Corps' capability 
of doing amphibious expeditionary operations in a contested environment. Uh, that, I think, is going to be a significant capability that's necessary there in the future, no matter what scenario you look at, manned versus unmanned. I know that you all look at all these different scenarios, but I wanted to get your best professional military judgment about where we are on the current track with the total composition of the amphibious fleet, composition of large deck amphibs, uh, the composition of what you believe you need to prosecute uh, the efforts that you'll undertake if we find ourselves uh, having to do amphibious operations in a contested environment. Uh, thanks, sir. The impact on the industrial uh, base, uh, I'll ask if uh, Mr. Gertz has any comments there. On the operational side, which was the point of your yeah. question, under the hood, as you uh, described, sir, under the 38 is 12 big decks, then 13, and then 13. Mm -hmm. And that type model series, that breakout is based on the 2016 force structure assessment. And I don't know how the 2019 will look. It could go north also, because 2016 was before the national defense strategy, before the defense planning guidance, before the national military strategy. It was frustrating at Pearl Harbor watching uh, that ship be pier side when all the other countries pull out with their ships. Yeah. And uh, sh that kip, that's a sh that's a very capable ship. Mm -hmm. Just uh, it's really frustrating. I know the, the the congressman was frustrated when he saw it happen also. But that, fr frankly, sir, uh, part of that is our fault. Part of that is when we rode the the force hard and deferred maintenance and did that again and again. It, it didn't just affect the condition of the ships as you hint at, it also uh, sent messages to the industrial base where we're all over the map in terms of our maintenance. So just like our cars, if we don't change the oil on time, we're gonna pay a bigger price later. We have to do them on time. We cannot defer maintenance. We, we took risk in that consciously, deliberately, but now we cannot afford to do that. Right now, based on the requirement, we have got to have 12, 13, and 13, and they have got to be ready to go with the right systems on board. Very good. Let me ask you to elaborate a little bit because you talk about how much risk is accepted. If, if we find ourselves today having to operate, doing amphibious operations in a contested environment, uh, would the Marine Corps be capable of prosecuting that fight, and if so, how much risk are we taking on? Because you talk about the capabilities that do get limited by maintenance availabilities, the ships that are on call uh, available to go tonight. Um, this morning, uh, I looked at the availability of the amphibs, as I'm sure other folks do too. This morning, I think it was 19, perhaps, that were out of 32 that were ready to go. I think uh, over time that will climb just like aviation does as we reset the force that we, the, the maintenance that we deferred for a decade and a half. But the risk, uh, probably two parts real quickly, sir. One is the, the way we think we will need to fight, and we're talking expeditionary advanced base operations and distributed maritime operations. That's a vision for where we will need to go and compete and win. The force we have this afternoon, while we're sitting in here, will not do that to the degree we needed to. So the risk, to your point, operationally, tactically, it takes you longer. Um, you don't have the capabilities that you need for the commander to pull off the missions in the way that he wants to do it. So his choices are constrained. Uh, and lastly, the reliability, when you need the availability of your ships, you need to know what you have. Thank you. I wanted to um, thank you, too, for the great job you're doing there at McCittick and uh, also for your family's legacy of service uh, with your dad, who we all know well, uh, also a Marine. So thank you so much uh, for your family's legacy of service. Secretary Gertz, I, I just want to circle the square here with all that we've heard. It's great to talk about 355 ships, building new ships, and we even talk about the manning of those ships, having sailors. But one of the things, too, that's critical, the Navy's just come out with is the 30-year ship maintenance program. And I think as we've seen this theme come up with uh, not doing the RCOH, the um, refueling complex overhaul on Truman, we see 
the delays in maintenance on amphibs. We see what's happening with the Boise, who's going to be tied up at the pier for another year. We see the demand signal for subs. Uh, I want to make sure that at the top of the list for the Navy is that sustainment element of making sure that we are not extending these maintenance availabilities, that maintenance availabilities are kept. The 30-year ship maintenance plan, I would argue, becomes as important, if not more important. You're never going to get to 355 if we don't maintain the ships that we have. So um, I don't expect to comment back, but I just want to emphasize how extraordinarily important that is. You know, it's, it's, it's nice to talk about building new. It's, it doesn't make the headlines to talk about maintaining what we have. But if we are going to have the capability necessary to counter our adversaries, you've heard this theme, I'm on every class of ship today, we don't get anywhere to where we need to be. Whether it's requirement in different ship classes or the overall requirement, we do not get there if we do not really ramp up our efforts uh, on the ship maintenance side and make sure, too, that we look at everybody, the public yards and the private yards, as partners in that effort. Uh, seeing, seeing some things develop into adversarial relationships have not been good for where we find ourselves today. So I urge you to make sure that that is as at an important level as shipbuilding and the manning components of what, what we've talked about today. Yes, sir. It's, it's uh, actually the number one piece on my job right now. As you say, we, we still have work to go on new construction. We have a lot of work to go on this sustainment, getting it affordable, getting it reliable, and getting it credible so fleet commanders have confidence that we'll get ships in and out yeah. when we say we're going to get them in and out so that they can go plan operations and be ready to go. It's got my number one attention. The committees mm -hmm. uh, adding sustainability yep. to my uh, job jar uh, helped uh, emphasize your point greatly. Right. And in I take that very seriously. In on time, out on time. Very good. Roger, Thank you, Mr. Sir, if I may, uh, yes, please. Kind of reinforce my Marine brother at the end of the table here on uh, Navy's commitment as well to the amphib fleet. Um, we were very motivated to accelerate the LHA for a lot of reasons, uh, notwithstanding the war fighting is number one, but also just the program on where that ship is going to be piling up on uh, other procurement programs. But the sustainment piece is big. You, I mean, all three of us here uh, drives our day. Uh, if you recall, uh, the committee directed us to comment on sustainment in, the, in this year's shipbuilding plan, so we added an appendix to talk about the challenge of not just today, uh, for a 300 ship navy, but what's it going to look like for a 355 ship navy? So right. we're uh, we're with you 100 percent on that, and the maintenance plan was just the partner in that sustainment plan as we're going forward. Very good, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You'll thank back. you, Mr. Whitman, uh, Congresswoman Hill. Hello, and thank you. Uh, my brother is a future sailor who's going off to buds imminently. So thank you for your service, and I look forward to being part of the Navy family. Uh, I understand that the f average age of the sea lift fleet is very old, and it's not a large fleet. Um, what investments do you, we need to make in, uh, in order to make sure that our warfighters can respond on time to large-scale hypothetical crisis situation in either the Korean Peninsula or the Baltic states? Yes, ma'am. I'll start out with that. And again, either, either my partners can jump in from a warfighting capability. So that's absolutely critical and, quite frankly, not something we had paid as much attention to as we needed to in the past, both keeping our current ready reserve fleet uh, moderate and ready to go, as well as thinking about the challenges ahead. Uh, for the current fleet, we're looking kind of a three-prong attack, uh, using the authorities that uh, Congress has given us to procure some used uh, ships to, to, as kind of a immediate stopgap. Uh, we've got one programmed in 21 and then another one in 22. Uh, and then looking at a lot of service life extensions to, uh, to extend wherever we can the service life. And then finally, a new procurement uh, towards the end of the budget year. Uh, that's kind of on the traditional side. I think maybe Admiral Merge can talk some of the non-traditional logistics kind of distributed piece because we not only have to fix the long haul big kind of move in the Navy and the Marine Corps and the Army, quite frankly, around, it's also kind of the tactical logistics in a very distributed manner that's going to be a challenge. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. The uh uh, it, it turns out the, the actual lift portion, the requirement is fairly stable. We just have to recapitalize that fleet. fleet. It, it, it's literally decaying out from underneath us. So uh, partnering with Secretary Gertz, we're very committed to that three-pronged approach. Where the requirement looks to be growing is when you're in a peer competition and you are a forward deployed Navy, the ability to push these logistics to the fighting force while they're fighting is uh, an area that we're 
looking at very closely. And it's, it's really just that distributed light or fast force that we're gonna see uh, likely requirement growth. So across the board, as we say in the off season, this has captured a lot of our attention to study uh, our logistics because it is the sustaining factor for a forward operating Navy. Um, thank you. Well, uh, uh, Rob, last, last call. Jared, you all set? Okay, thank you. Um, so thank you all for being here. I, you know, one um, comment I wanted to make re regarding Mr. Cisneros' question regarding the Manning and sort of maybe relevant to uh, Congresswoman Hill. Last, during the break, I was out at Great Lakes uh, Naval Training Center and, um, you know, saw the work that's being done there about, you know, creating the, the uh, sailors and officers that we need to man a, a larger Navy. And Admiral Bernacchi is doing just an outstanding job. Um, the, you know, quality, and enthusiasm was just, uh, it was unbelievable, just sort of seeing what's going, and the size uh, of, of what's going on there. So, um, you know, to your point, Admiral Moore, is that, you know, we, we are really, the Navy is very much focused in terms of that whole issue of manpower. Um, it's real, I mean, and, and, and certainly, uh, you know, had a chance to get a glimpse of it. So, anyway, well, thank you all for um, your testimony here today. I'm sure there'll be some follow-up questions uh, as we get closer to the markup. And, um, and with that, I'll close the hearing. Good. Yep. That's good. Yep.